because the moon was strong enough that it was a minus 40 day, that there was enough light to actually turn the system on. It was only making about 25 watts. But if you can do that with the moon, you know, you're still doing that in the sun. Even an inch of snow, you're still having uh, solar irradiance go through that. Uh, and it still is able to harvest. To say how exact, it all depends on the snow cover, what's there for trees, or even the house next to you being built. Uh, you know, like in Ontario, if this was a new subdivision, because of his solar, they'd actually have to move their house over or bring it down so in the winter it doesn't have that thing to put light shade onto this house under the Green Energy Act. So ideally you want your house there. So um, actually the best, uh, you're wanting to go to 612 pitch to be the best. 1212 is ready for winter, but you're not maximizing for your winter months. You're really wanting to maximize the summer. So about, if, you know, anywhere from 30 to 25 degrees is, is what we're shooting. And I just want to expand on that a little bit. Um, when we're designing as solar designers in, in a grid tie situation like this, we're, we're designing it so that it's maximized so you're producing as much as you can for nine months of the year when we don't have snow. Just geographically, that's just the way that we have to adapt. If we were doing an off-grid design, though, then we would, be, we would be designing that system to be most efficient in the winter time because that's when our sun is, is at minimum. So it, it's really a, you know, it's, it's kind of a give and take, um, you know, um, but, but ultimately this is what we tell our clients. If you are producing energy on your roof in January, December, or, or February, awesome. But that's not when you're going to be producing, that's, that's not going to be your, produ your, you know, your maximum produ producing time. It's not that. So, um, like if this was off grid also, what we can do is pitch that top row, the, this middle row, and then we leave the other one flat, basically using that to bounce off any of the extra rays coming in to reflect down onto the others. So we can make this just an all year round system just by changing the pitching of that. And then, you know, helping us, the, the light is only able to absorb about 20 to 30%. Um, so the light that's being cash out, cast down will help. And then also for, because if it was off grid, you want the top panel to shed, which would then force the next ones down to shed quicker, right? And then you've kind of got your all year round uh, acid light. <coughs> So are each of those small squares, is that a panel or is no, there... No, so this here is your panel. Each one of these small squares are your solar cells individually hooked in series and then parallel to make your 40, 44 volts at 8.6 amps. So what's the actual panel? So this here, this black frame that goes around. So there's three of them here and a little ten of them along the way. Uh, there are 255 of these ones here. Uh, we kind of went to a 300 block, but then you're in a 72 cell, so technically what we do is we take the size of the roof, what you're wanting to produce, either budget or to get to a goal, and then we decide whether we use uh, 72 or 60 cells, like at John's house, if we would have went to a 72 cell, we could have only got six solar modules up there, so even though they were five watts more per module, he wouldn't have been able to get as many kilowatts on his roof. So that's why we custom design. Like, I always have people, what's an average, and it's, it's hard to give an average because every roof is different whether it's cottage, pitch, hip, um, and then everybody's, you know, um, you guys might use uh, 10 times more power than, say, a family of four, which we have run into that situation, retired couple, and they're producing, or using more power than someone else, just because they're not used to it, per se, to turn things off. What kind of thing, or is that? Um, basically, that's your standard test condition at 25 degrees Celsius, 1.2 air mass with 1,000 watts per square meter. Uh -huh. So how much does how much does a panel cost? <laughs> Roughly you know, a dollar a watt. Depends <laughs> on uh, where we're getting it. Um, and the efficiencies. It, 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 there's a lot of different things. They start at anywhere from uh, eighty cents a watt all the way up to a dollar thirty a watt. And it, it all depends on the module. If you're looking at off grid, well, those are even more because uh, they, it takes a lot more to hook them up. It's a special run compared to grid time. So. One that follows the sun. 
then it adjusts the panel yeah. accordingly. Like a yeah. satellite dish. So you're going to do it on a flat roof, that's definitely what you need. Um, no, you wouldn't typically put a tractor up on a flat roof uh, because your ballast weight and the weight of the panel being fixed on one, one area, you're going to overload it. Um, so usually on a flat roof, you'll maximize, uh, usually at a 50 to 20 degree angle because of your weighting and everything like that. You don't want to go over that because it's like a big sail. Uh, so usually when we do a flat roof, we're sitting at about 15 degrees. So uh, yeah, if you're going to do a tractor, usually they're on the ground. Did grants apply to on or off grid applications? Only grid tie. Only grid tie. Only, only if you're connecting to soft power will you get that 20% rebate. Um, and also if you're putting it on a business or a legal farm, there is also a 50% capital cost right off. So, you know, we do have farmers that need that extra, businesses that need to bring uh, themselves down to a lower tax practice. So they'll put in solar to knock down 50% of what they're being taxed on, actually helping them boost their own income and become their own power producers, paying themselves for power versus someone else. Yeah, they're doing about 98% of their heating and cooling with that system. So it, it is working quite well, actually. No, they've kind of, you know, it, it's because everything else is getting much bigger and because of the price of solar PV, more people are doing PV than, than thermal because of the fact of it's still mechanical. Uh, with thermal, you're, you're running thousands of feet of glycol loops. You're running hundreds of pumps which are drawing anywhere from 75 to 150 watts running 24-7, which is there again another big draw. Uh, you know, so people are going through. Yeah. So, like a lot of people, you can use uh, solar PV and hook it right to your hot water tank and do that also and really have no moving parts. Yeah, um, you basically touched on that question, but uh, what sort of maintenance problems have you had? You said like cells? With solar, with solar PV? Yeah. Nothing. Like the way they test these is golf ball size hail at 50 mile an hour with a steel ball there. Yeah. So there's, you know, um, if you want to be really particular on maximizing your energy harvest, you'll clean them once a month. It just depends on uh, the person. Some people never clean them. Some people have us come out and clean them for them. Some people clean them. So you can walk on that? You can. I don't recommend it, but you can walk on them. They, they've had they have ones that uh, they do a test with a quarter ton truck and they park a tire on each solar panel. The only thing is, you don't want to walk on them because you do not want to crack those cells. Those cells that are in there, um, basically you touch them and they crumble. They're uh, an earth style um, composite and, and it's very, very brittle until you put it behind the glass and then laminate the back of it. So I have done it where I've stood on them, but I don't recommend it because you don't want to, and you don't want to crack your, your, your seal on the outside, otherwise it starts letting moisture in and moisture and electricity aren't. So, um, for example, I'll kind of just quickly touch on the electric vehicle side. Um, Sun Country Highways offered to donate the city some electric vehicle charging stations. They don't see the advantage in it. Um, but to draw people in, like we have a race going coast to coast right now with a thousand people, um, to charge my car it's two dollars an hour. That's the cheapest ecotourism attraction we were going to use to bring people to our city. But they're having an issue with it because they think it's too forward thinking where we've got smaller communities in Regina doing it and cities like Edmonton looking at switching out their whole city to be able to allow the electric vehicles through. Um, so, you know, to have people understanding these things is really big. I don't know if any of you read the article where it says they're putting in three charging stations at $26,000 is what they're looking at. But they didn't say that at each one of those stations there's actually three car chargers going in at that price, and that's at using a higher priced employee than looking at going with someone else who can bring that cost down less than half. Um, but you know, to charge my electric vehicle at two dollars an hour to draw someone to the community for three to four hours for six dollars with the power of what they're going to bring in for a tax and everything like that, it's a great event. You know, you think of what the ads in tourism magazines and anything else are. That, that is one of the most inexpensive ways. But it's just educating, right? You know, even people say, well, you're driving an electric vehicle, that's, that's worse than driving gas because you're using coal to power. How did you pull the oil out of the ground? How did you refine it? How did you transport it? 
you've used coal 17 times to make that one gallon of gas, where I can inject it into my car directly or put organic power into my vehicle. You know, so there's just, uh, you know, just to kind of take that to another area. Oh, obviously. I'm sorry if, some, if this is being covered already. Is it is it modular? Is it expandable? Like, can you put up one and then add more? Well, there there's a limit. Um, eight is the limit you can put in on this system here uh, to actually wake up your inverter. Huh. Um, so in the winter, it's not a big deal, but in the summer, when you get over 25 degrees Celsius, you have to have a minimum of eight modules hooked in uh, to actually wake up your inverter because it's hotter. It's, it needs a little more juice, right? So. Um, yeah, eight panels is minimum, and then we can add to them up to a certain amount to the threshold of that inverter and your roof size, and then after that we just throw in a new inverter and start adding to it again. And there are some soft costs involved in terms of doing a project itself. So, um, so like for example, SAS Power has a, a $315 fee for you to, um, to even submit the application. Okay, and then you gotta, there's a few other things, and then you have to buy a bi-directional meter. So you're looking at about $1,000 in just soft costs to even get a project going. So in terms of, I mean, they're certainly expandable and we would uh, do our best to accommodate what your goals essentially would be. So like if in five years from now you wanted to have uh, 20 panels, but you can only do 10 now, then we would, we would, um, and do what we can in terms of designing so to allow you to accommodate it uh, down the road as easy as possible. So whether that means getting a bigger inverter to, sit, to uh, house potentially the extra 10 panels in two years from now, or you know, something along those lines. So well, also even your, your, basically what we can do is phase one, phase two, phase three. So when we do your electrical line drawing, basically we say, in this year we're doing phase one, consisting of X amount of kilowatts. Um, next year we're going to do phase two, X amount of kilowatts, right? So, so many panels. And then phase three. So basically as long as you do it that way, we've kind of helped you with your soft cost right away taking some of it out because each time we apply we're not having to put in a new electrical line drawing because that costs money to have the line drawing done plus for SAS power to review it. So as long as you know where you're expanding to, and that's why it's important to be very transparent of what you're looking at doing, we can build all that into the initial cost. And then every time you just add on, we just go to SAS Power and say, refer to phase two, we're going ahead as of this date, it'll be commissioned, come to inspect. 